as um, Shashi Deshpande should be. But I, you know, one is always tempted to do what one shouldn't. So I, I've written a keynote address. <laughs> here it is. Thanks everybody, and thanks. And it's so wonderful to have you all sitting here, a full hall. In Bombay, it would have been like ten people in me, and five people I would have brought along. <laughs> <laughs> Words are what I do. I have lived by their promise for the majority of my working life. Like so many writers, I began as a reader. And as a reader, words seemed transparent. They had something to say, and I was reading them, and the world was beginning to take on a new color and a new texture. My experiences, I felt, had a new depth and a new richness, thanks to my reading. To me, words were then our allies, our willing allies, in the process by which we civilized the world around us one word at a time, one naming at a time. Of course, of course this was the prelapsarian phase of innocence. And it seems sometimes that one can only use the word innocence if one is going to speak in the very next sentence of a fall from innocence. I don't know when this happens, when you begin to realize that you have placed your faith in the intangible and the volatile. Was it the moment when you thought you knew what a word meant and you found that it meant something quite different when you looked it up? Is it the moment when you begin to realize that a poem that you had passed in one particular way, you were told by a teacher, meant something completely different, and she had to be correct because she was a teacher? Or when you read that the poet meant something else? There is a moment when words begin what will be a lifelong cycle of betrayals and seductions fresh seductions each time. Perhaps it actually begins when you begin to communicate and you find that words are not transparent but translucent. They refract your meaning because as soon as they pass from you, they are received and the story of their reception is the story of the receiver in toto. No one receives a word but she has a history to bring to bear on that word. For everyone who has worked in words, there is a perfect receiver. The perfect receiver is someone who will see exactly what we mean. There is never any misunderstanding because the perfect receiver can do everything that we cannot do. She will imagine the characters in the way we imagine them. She will hear their voices in her head as we heard their voices in ours. She will put in missing colors and shade in backgrounds with the exact emotional tonality that existed when we were inventing those moments. She will receive each word in the exact way we planned it. Need I say, therefore, that she has the same political coloring, the same life experiences, the same privileges, the same, the same, the same. Need I say, therefore, that she is impossible? There was a time when I believed that I was the perfect reader of my work. And it is possible at the time of writing when I am the moment of taking an evanescent and fast-changing thought and pinning it to paper, I accept defeat. I know I will never capture what I wanted to say because what I want to say is specific to me and language is not specific to me. Its magic lies in its generalized meaning. But I am, when I am putting this word down now, I know what it means and I know what I wanted to say. The problem is that I am not a single changing entity either. I am changing because I am subject to the movement of time, to the, to the pressure of new information. I am therefore changing, I am growing, I am degenerating. It only depends on which way you are looking at who I am. So I often cease to be the perfect reader for my work. I come up, up against it later and I lament its lack of precision, its deficiencies in clarity and in compassion. Now I have abandoned this attempt to characterize words and I accept reluctantly that the gift of language is one of the greatest we have given ourselves and it is labeled Timeo Danao Se Dona Ferentis. Let the receiver beware. These words are dangerous. Which brings me to the word danger. The word danger is a strange thing. Most of, it, of us learn it at the time when we are children and it jumps out at us from posters in a bright red with a memento mori behind it of skull and crossbones reminding you of your own mortality of the possibility that if you do something you will die 
But slowly we come to see danger as one of the necessary concomitants of living, and certainly one of the most important negotiations we make in our march to civilization. If we are always to be safe, we will stagnate. I think of the great pioneers of food when I consider the Hindi Muhavra. Bandar kya jane adrak ka swad. How can a monkey know what ginger tastes like or how wonderful ginger is? And how could the first woman who bit into ginger know that it would be magical one day in tea and in cookies? How could she know that it would make such masala so exciting and tinctures so potent? Being human therefore means that we must take risks or, it will be, or we will begin to degenerate and our language will degenerate with us. That is why we have made a pact with fear. I should like to look at the anatomy of this emotion for a moment, probably because it is one of the most important things developed in our repertoire of feelings. If evolution gave us love and language so that we should build families and societies, I suspect fear was put into the package so that we should learn to take steps to defend ourselves from those who should like to do us harm. We will always, therefore, need fear. It is part of what makes us human. But did evolution also give us hate? Or was it simply another word for fear? If, as we develop a sense of self, as of the self as composed of two parts, of one part of the self as it knows it is, one part as the self within the eyes of others, in the mirror so the eyes of others, we must have decided that we were not capable of fear. That was for the weak. The strong would therefore hate and turn hate into violence. So who do you hate? Forget for the moment the hatred that is outside you. Forget for the moment the hatred that is aimed at you. Who do you hate? Perhaps you hate out of a sense of injustice. X behaved, unjustly, behaved unjustly to me and so therefore I hate him and I am entitled to that hate. We all feel entitled to our hatreds because only we know what we have suffered. We all feel entitled to our emotions because they are our emotions. It's just those others who shouldn't hate because their hate vitiates the atmosphere and makes th things terrible for all of us. It is not easy to talk about hatred but it is even more difficult to talk about fear. To admit to fear is to admit to vulnerability. It suggests someone hiding in a cave, paralyzed by the terror of the night and the glint of canine teeth. So by the alchemy peculiar to the human being, we reinvented fear and made it hate. Hate now has an active, potent, powerful feeling to it. Fear seems passive. You have no choice but to fear, but hate? Hate seems like something you would choose to do and then you can gather around you some more fearful people who want to hide their fears and you can form a mob and raise your mashals and go out after the source of your fear. So why do so many people fear writers? What were Kalburgi and Pansare and Dabholkar and Lamkesh doing that they were so feared? I think we have all begun to understand now how powerful words are. As children, we had a chant, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It was used whenever an insult was hurled, but I suspect even then we spoke out of hurt, thus proving we knew already that what was being said was potent, it was powerful, and it had the potential to cause pain. In college, it became fashionable to end those long discussions on the comparative merits of Marxism and capitalism or the ex agrarian crisis or whatever it was that was coming up with the remark, this is all talk, what we need is action. This seemed unanswerable then because we were not voters and we could not make much of a change and we weren't in, the, in charge of the price of Kalyan Sona or other wheat forms. I wish I had known then what I know now, that we use words and we talk because they are one of the best ways to communicate the thoughts that we have and therefore they are potent magic. That those actions not based on thought 
will only lead to further problems. But in the silence that fell, after the call to action came, we were colluding in demeaning language and those who use it. We were not guarding the gift we had been given, the gift of language. We have nothing to fear but fear itself, we have been told so endlessly. I wish that were true. I think we have a lot to fear. It is rational these days to be afraid, but it is also difficult to acknowledge that fear and to accept it for what it is, and even more difficult not to hate the people who are making you afraid, because then you become those people. We are always going to walk among people who are not like us. The world is diverse, that this diversity is also a gift, and it is specially a gift for writers. If we were all the same, there would be no one to write for, nothing to write about. The perfect reader would, of that I mentioned would become the monster reader because he would know everything you had to say. He would feel what you were feeling. And there would be no and writing would indeed then become a solipsism. But we live in a world in which there will be people who will be different. Some will celebrate difference, some will ignore it, some will try to make light of it and dismiss it, some will work to eliminate it, some will be afraid of it, and of those who are afraid of it, some will hate. I come back then to another question. What do we do about the situation we are in? I suppose we can only do what we have always done. We will continue to write because we consider risk important, because we consider language important because we consider each other too important to allow someone to go without criticism. There is no way to mandate bravery. Nor is it useful to say something on the lines like, if you can't take the heat, stay out of the kitchen. In our age, it is impossible to say what might cause offense, what might anything, what, what might bring about anything from death to trolling, and all the unpleasant things that happen in between. So what if you want to be a cook and you must suddenly confront a furnace in the kitchen and not a stove? I got the feeling that I'm preaching anyway to the converted. You would believe in freedom of speech, wouldn't you? You would believe in the importance of the word. You would believe in the value of dialogue or why would you be here? But perhaps it is important to say it again. We have no choice but to do it afraid. Outside the world is dark, but it is not completely without light. We still have books. We still have the law. We still have readers. We still have festivals. We have royalty checks. And most of all, we have each other. We can do this thing. We can be human. We can deepen our sense of being human through literature. We can offer this gift to others, though they may refuse it, they may reject it, or return ashes for our beauty. We can do this because we have no other choice. And so I make a commitment today to listening to you. Ma soeur et mon frère, mes semblables. I will try to listen to you even if I do not like what I am hearing. I will try to listen to you even when you are shouting at me. I will try to listen beyond the percussion of your age and the hammering of your words, the quick and savage responses I am capable of. I will try to see that you are my imperfect reader, but that is only because I am an imperfect writer, and if we cannot do this for each other, we can do nothing together. Thank you. <laughs>